it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to give this seminar. Um, this talk is about meta analysis, one way of synthesizing the evidence. Uh, one of the main concerns related to evidence synthesis is the possibility of bias occurrence. Uh, bias uh, can be described as an error that leads to one result rather than other. So the outline of this presentation, uh, a short introduction, uh, then uh, during this talk, uh, we will discuss this question, how to deal with potential publication bias in meta-analysis. At the end, uh, several conclusions. Um, Meta-analysis shifts the focus uh, from single studies to aggregate evidence. Meta-analysis is the analysis of the analysis. Uh, in several research areas, such as medicine, uh, the single studies are uh, rarely conclusive, and uh, several researchers contribute to the same research question, <laughs> the re replication. So, standard methods for meta-analysis assume that all studies have addressed the same question uh, in a similar way and provide information on a common parameter of interest. Um, let's uh, exemplify with a simple toy example uh, the meta-analysis procedure. Um, I use uh, this forest plot. Um, and uh, in this toy example, we have 20 independent studies uh, that report one effect size. Here is a, a treatment effect. Um, all these studies uh, report this effect size. Um, and uh, all the, uh, also uh, um, a precision measure, a standard error. Um, in the forest plot, we can uh, describe each uh, study individually by uh, confidence interval and also uh, the uh, synthesis of evidence through one model. The most popular models are these two ones. Uh, the common effects assume all the studies have a common effect. And random effects assume uh, some heterogeneity between studies and include this heterogeneity in the model. We have random effects uh, model. Uh, the overall effect, uh, the synthesis of evidence, um, could be uh, interpreted as a, a weighted average of all individual effect size under analysis. Um, in general, it is adequate to assume the normality of the effect size measure, uh, but in certain effect size measure transformation are used to make this assumption more plausible. So uh, in this toy example, we use the random effect model. We explore the heterogeneity. Um, there are several <laughs> tools to do that. And uh, here we conclude a moderate heterogeneity, uh, significant moderate heterogeneity, and we use um, the random effect models, including the uh, heterogeneity between studies. In this toy example, the overall effect size uh, is uh, 0 0.29, and uh, it is represented in the forest plot by a diamond. Um, the, the diamond represents the confidence interval, and the confidence interval doesn't include the zero, so the effect size uh, is significant. So, systematic review and meta-analysis uh, meta approach holds a great promise for uh, the advancement of knowledge, but can be sensitive to discussion. Uh, bias distort meta-analytic effect size estimates, uh, and it is a huge difficulty uh, in uh, this kind of analysis. So, to what extent do different degrees of bias distort meta-analytic effect size estimates? Degrees of bias can be measured, can be correct, can be included in the meta-analysis. So, it is this the point. How to deal with potential bias in a synthesis of evidence? There are several sources of bias. Uh, publication bias is one of them. 
uh, but the poor research designs uh, include uh, several sorts of bias. Um, but now we will discuss publication of bias. Um, publication of bias arises when the probability that a scientific study uh, is published uh, is not independent of its results. Uh, this issue uh, can be at the origin of exaggerated or wrong evidence. So, wide publication uh, bias. Studies that do not reveal significant evidence uh, tend to be less cited, less preferred by editors, and results study of studies that do not support the research hypothesis may motivate reanalysis and the eventual the end of the study. Um, study authors may be reluctant to submit for publication if they feel the result did not provide strong enough evidence uh, in support of the favorite hypothesis. So, the possibility of publication bias also encouraged the development of tools for its eventual discussion, detection, and correction. In fact, it's not possible to identify publication bias di directly. We can go to the file drawer and see uh, the work that uh, was published. But uh, we can uh, look for certain features in our data that mm, may be indicative of it. So we will discuss publication bias uh, and we divide the publication bias in two parts. Um, the selective publication of positive results uh, and the p-hacking. Selective publication uh, occurs when studies uh, with positive findings are more likely to be published than studies with negative findings. Positive findings uh, uh, we obtain when we obtain our uh, question, our research question um, with significant results. Negative is the, the other. Uh, the reason to, for uh, negative results uh, could be small sample size, but could we couldn't have uh, an, a null effect. So uh, what we report uh, is, is uh, only um, bias when the, the null effect is the true effect. So, to uh, explore uh, this uh, publication bias, we can uh, use several approaches. Uh, we will discuss, discuss the, the popular funnel plot and several um, approaches related to the funnel plot, to the symmetry of the funnel plot, and selection models uh, to publication bias adjustment. Uh, looking at the funnel plot should surely be the first step. Um, what is a funnel plot? It is a graphic that plots uh, study effect size uh, against uh, the inverse of their precision. You can see here the zero and the key here the the zero point four, so inverse. Um, the name of the graph results from uh, an increased trend uh, in the precision of the estimate as the sample size increase. Uh, the, the plot uh, will resemble a symmetric invert funnel if um, there is no bias or uh, between uh, study uh, heterogeneity. Uh, and uh, the diagonals lines correspond to confidence uh, interval bounds. If uh, uh, we use 95 uh, confidence interval, and if there is no heterogeneity, no publication bias, um, we expect 95% of all studies should lie within the funnel and the plot should as uh, symmetric uh, appearance around the overall effect size. Okay. We can also add contours of statistical significance to the funnel plot. Uh, contours lines corresponding to the levels of statistical significance. 
Um, this facilitates in inspection of statistical significance of uh, study effect estimates and whether areas in which study seems to be missing. Um, if the studies appear to be missing in areas of low uh, statistical significance, here uh, area in white, then it is possible that the symmetry is due to the publication uh, bias. In our toy example, um, there is a suggestion of missing studies on the left-hand side of the plot uh, in the area of non-significance, for which publication bias is a plausible explanation. Okay. Funnel plot uh, is a graphical, uh, informal method for detecting potential publication bias. Uh, so some subjectivity in the analysis of the graph. Um, asymmetries can be explained by several factors. One is the publication bias, but can be uh, appear uh, through clinical or methodological heterogeneity between studies. And even if uh, there is publication bias in a review, it may not result in a clear asymmetrical uh, funnel plot. But uh, if we have asymmetries, we can uh, uh, say that uh, there are a possible uh, uh, publication bias. So to give some uh, objectivity in the, uh, in, in, in the analysis of the funnel plot, uh, some tests are uh, developed and uh, um, the tests for asymmetry of funnel plot more popular are Egger test and Beck test. Um, one is a regression test and the uh, other one is based on rank correlation uh, test. Um, but the, uh, given by the simulation studies, the Egger test uh, is the most preferred and uh, we will talk about a little bit about this test. So, um, if we have some asymmetry in the funnel plot, uh, we feel that effect size are not independent um, of the standard error. Higher uh, effect size values observed for studies with higher uh, standard errors. So this is the, uh, the motivation to uh, the Egger test, is try to uh, explore the dependence of the effect size from the standard error. And this is uh, the model. Um, of course, each study is weighted. The weight of each study is uh, related to the precision of this study. And uh, we can associate a weighted regression model. Uh, this uh, uh, weighted regression model is equivalent to a simple regression linear model um, of some standardized effect size as function of the inverse uh, of standard error. Um, is, it is easy to verif verify that the minimal square error estimator reveal the, the same solution in both scenarios. So um, we can look to the funnel plot or we can look to the rad radial plot uh, which is uh, a scatter plot um, with these two variables. Uh, and uh, to uh, discuss the symmetry of the funnel plot, we discuss if this parameter is null or not. If, you, if we have some dependence between effect size and standard error, um, this parameter alpha uh, it will be uh, non-zero. And the test is like this, 
we implement a regression and we test the parameters of the regression we apply to our toy example. And in fact, we uh, estimate the bias, the uh, alpha value, and we apply uh, the test uh, and we obtain uh, a significant result. Uh, so uh, this points to potential publication bias also. Let's uh, say something about the Egger test. Um, there are some limitations uh, in appropriate type uh, one error rate when heterogeneity present and the number of included studies is large. But uh, the, the general recommendation is use uh, this test for continuous outcomes and dictonous uh, outcomes without heterogeneity. So we can detect heterogeneity and we can, can we <laughs> correct for the effects of publication bias using the data we have? Several approaches have been developed for adjust full estimates like trim and fill, regression methods, selection models. Uh, this file draw, uh, drawer approach provides sensitivity analysis. In fact, sensitivity analysis they provide. The correction, um, maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, let's start with trim and fill. Uh, trim and fill uh, use, um, it is used to estimate and adjust the number of res results of studies that are missing from the meta-analysis to establish a symmetric funnel plot. Uh, these methods, it is assumed that in addition to the observed studies, there are relevant studies that were not analyzed due to publication bias, and we will include, we will have these uh, additional studies. Um, the motivation is to believe that there are studies with negative and undesirable results that are missing. The main steps uh, of um, trim and fill methods uh, is the trim and the fill. The trim uh, uh, part is about to estimate the number of asymmetric uh, studies. Look to this example, asymmetric uh, studies. Okay, on in this case, in this case, in this particular case, is it on the right side, um, and um, to identify these uh, asymmetric studies, we can use different estimators. The most popular and with more uh, with good results are these two one, the R estimator and L estimator, um, and. Okay, we uh, trim the data. Then uh, we uh, have to uh, go to the second part and we have to fill. Uh, from the remain uh, values, studies, we calculate the, we calculate a new center of the data, could be the true center. <laughs> and, uh, the missing studies are inserted, forming a mirror image uh, of the studies removed early. A final, uh, an adjust uh, global confidence interval is uh, calculated. So uh, we can use that methods, or we can use uh, regression uh, methods or based <laughs> on regression. If you remember the Egger uh, regression line, uh, looking to this model um, who, under the assumption that uh, smaller studies are more biased if uh, we explore the, the regression lines to a study uh, of infinite sample size uh, represent, uh, representing an MBA and we obtain a just defect estimate. So when we put the standard error in zero, we can obtain uh, an unbiased uh, estimate to the overall effect. So 
in this point we present this model and the second parameter of regression it is used to estimate the um, adjust uh, overall effect to the publication bias in our example we apply and this is the value uh, and adjusted uh, with the studies uh, considered and finding uh, in the in, in in the review and when we perform the treatment film methods we uh, correct uh, the, the the value the overall effect to this potential publication bias and the value is lower when we correct with the regression uh, scenario, uh, the value is uh, more lower. <laughs> um, the adjusted overall effect size estimate show confidence interval without over overlap uh, within with the unadjusted overall effect size confidence interval this point to the existence of the overall effect size sensitive to the published to then published studies um okay other uh, way to discuss publication bias uh, in the selection models the publication uh, bias pressure will be introduced in the model used um to estimate the, the, the meta-analytic overall effect size uh, we will discuss two approach one uh, is based on joint modeling and the other one uh, based on weighted distributions uh, so selection methods assess uh, and adjust for publication bias in meta-analysis they were first proposed by edges uh, and have been an active research area the models are based on assumption that t values and or sample size of primary studies influence the probability of their publication um, the studies with smaller p values or large sample size are more likely to be published uh, however no statistical method is going to solve the publication bias problem without making strong and uh, and very uh, and very fiable uh, assumptions mm, most selection models involve one or more parameters that govern the selection process uh, these parameters are typically unknown and may be difficult or impossible to estimate from a collection of observed effect size estimator it estimates particular if we uh, have a small number of studies um, and can appear some numerical problems if either the effect size model or the selection model is incorrect the inference may be far from the correct so this is the difficult area this method is used the, not so uh, many times because it is difficult it is a, a high difficult with these assumptions uh, and verify the, the assumptions of the models but we will discuss and we will uh, use and apply these methods as a sensitive approach try to see if the overall effect is sensitive to this kind of pressure uh, under the publication um copper selection model uh, will be um, described with more detail and uh, um, a general um, formulation about uh, selection models using weight weight distributions so sensitivity um, approach uh, of Copus, uh, or the selection model of Copus, is a joint modeling. We have two models, uh, the usual random effect model, and the other one uh, related to the, select, the, 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 the selection process. And um, 
these two models are uh, related um, by the correlation between the uh, both errors. Uh, if the correlation is zero, we have uh, the, the traditional uh, random uh, effect model of meta-analysis. Uh, if we have some correlation, so in this uh, case, we have some pressure, some uh, published, uh, some pressure in the, the, the uh, through the, um, the publication bias. So copper sensitivity uh, steps, uh, the principal steps are this one. Identify the range of selection models which cover uh, all reasonable possibilities. And we have uh, to define uh, these two parameters. Uh, these parameters are two sensitivity parameters describing the degree of selection um, which are not estimated but fixed. Um, the, the procedure starts with no relevant uh, or no degree of selection and fit copper selection model and repeat the copper selection model adjustment uh, for high levels uh, of degree of selection. And this degree of selection uh, usually uh, was measured by the possibility of publishing the, the trial, the, 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 the result, with large uh, standard error. The p-value uh, of residual selection bias is monitorized, and is this uh, the, the way uh, to decide uh, how to stop, when to stop. Um, when the p-value of residual selection bias is first non-significant, we stop and return the corresponding estimate effect size. Um, and standard errors and p-values and so on. <laughs> we apply uh, to our data, uh, to our example scenario, the adjust the, and the adjust the overall effect size estimate show uh, this confidence interval with the null value and the effect estimated by uh, the corpus ma uh, model is this one. In fact, we stop the procedure here where the p-value for the test of residual selection bias is higher than our cut value. And uh, what you, we can say, um, these two intervals um, have, have no overlap. Um, and we can uh, say that uh, there are sensitivity to the existence of publication bias. Um, selection models using weighted distribution um, include the publication pressure here, but is a weighted distribution. We uh, fixed as F the distribution of true effect, true, true uh, um, distribution when we, we don't have no uh, publication selection. Uh, and this is the distribution of the uh, study published. Uh, so our focus, we can estimate this using our observed data. Uh, we have to assume things about the pressure, the publication pressure, but we want to talk about the true distribution is the focus. And uh, there are several uh, available weight distribution model, which can uh, be estimated by Bayesian approach or classical approach using uh, such maximum likelihood estimators. Um, and this one use maximum likelihood estimators and this one Bayesian um, approach. Um, for the example scenario, uh, when we include the publication pressure, 
um, the model uh, we obtain in fact a low effect size this is the original non-adjusted effect size is low but the confidence interval uh, not includes the zero so uh, the effect the overall effect uh, is uh, considering this result uh, could be uh, considered as significant so um, is another result uh, I also applied uh, the method using Bayesian approach. I estimate the the overall effect without uh, uh, adjustment using uh, Bayesian methods, and uh, uh, there are the the cred. Uh, I'll say the the cred. Uh, oh, the name. Uh, the cleavable interval, yes, I, it is in the name, um, and we can see that the results does not change a lot, and uh, doesn't include the null effect. Null, uh, effect. So we can uh, have publication bias do selective publication of positive results but also because peaking what is peaking peaking occurs when the researcher collect or select data or statistical analysis until non-significant results become significant uh, peaking can be caused by Bad intention good intention to help the data reveal the insights that are presumably even in them. Okay, the idea that you can prove everything with statistics can be uh, a motivator of some extent. Um, Abuse examples, bias due to con controlled uh, confound confounding, data cleaning, uh, removing and handling outliers, imputation of missing, uh, this can promote results generated by the manipulation, uh, and this could be a problem. Quantify p hacking is important because publication of false positive inhibits scientific progress. When false positive results enter uh, the literature, they can be very persistent. False positives can inspire investment uh, in with less research programs and even uh, discredit the research field. So let's see how to check, how to evaluate uh, p-hacking. Um, we can use p-curve. P-curve um, is the distribution of p-values for a set of studies. When the true effect size is uh, a non-zero, uh, the expect distribution uh, of p-values is exponential with a right skewness. Um, as the true effect size increases, the p-value, the p-curve is more right skinned. skinned. Uh, when the true effect size is null, the expect distribution is uniform. So. P-hacking can be evaluated based on the shape of the P-curve and uh, increased uh, in distribution of P-values uh, around 0 0.05 is indicative of publication bias. Um, selective publication bias uh, and P-hacking uh, also uh, uh, increase this value. To identify p hacking, only we only consider the significant findings, p values lower than uh, 0 0.05. In the presence of p hacking, it is expected a uh, left skewed p curve. There are uh, 
a complement analysis of the P curve, uh, we can test test for right skewness and uh, for flatness. Uh, to support the hypothesis of absent of p in publication bias, is, it is desirable to have a significant result in the right skewness, uh, but not significant test for the flatness. Um, okay, for the example scenario, uh, we obtain this result, um, and we obtain a significant right skewness, and the non-significant uh, flatness, um, which point to no publication pressure. Um, uh, okay, and uh, it, it is that. <laughs> uh, in general, P curve and corresponding tests can be useful to explore whether a given set of significant findings is merely the result of selective report. There are models to include p hacking adjustment. Um, in fact, I only found this one. Uh, p hacking model uh, is a, a weighted distribution model, including the pressure of publication of uh, p hacking uh, in the weight. Um, um, function. Uh, based on estimate effect size and standard error uh, is, 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 is the, this, this weight distribution. Uh, so analysis, uh, this author that published this model say that analysis peak hacking is hard without serious simplifying assumptions. And this is a difficult because we don't know if these assumptions is refine our data. Um, we apply uh, the model developed by these authors um, and we obtain this result. This is a Bayesian uh, approach. Uh, the value is quite robust but uh, the interval include, not, do not include the zero. Okay, one way to stop p hacking, I think, is look to individual studies authors and disclose their data analysis strategies and report all analysis they conduct along uh, with the results obtained. I think the way to suppress p hacking is this one, uh, but we can explore naturally when we develop a systematic revision and meta-analysis. Um, some conclusions. Um, so various procedure for addressing publication bias were discussed. To address publication bias is one uh, in one synthesis of evidence, the research should proceed through a logical sequences of analysis, potential bias detection, potential bias sensitivity, and maybe a synthesis of evidence adjusting the potential bias. If we can uh, verify the assumptions of the model, yeah, could be uh, a good idea adjusting the, the, potential, the overall effect to the uh, potential bias. Bias uh, in the synthesis of evidence is a difficult issue to deal with and is not a closed issue. Uh, I think we have to uh, keep this in mind, the form of, and the content of what is reported in individual studies have changed over the time. Uh, nowadays, the negative results uh, they, uh, I think we published more negative results than the past. Uh, and there are new challenges that lead to the development of new methods that are more suited to uh, reality. Although several simulation scenarios uh, have been developed a lot, but there are uh, a lot of scenarios to uh, perform and to compare the, um, the the, the, the results of 
different uh, uh, methods. And I think it's not necessary to be very creative because we can find a lot of uh, scenarios that uh, in the literature are not discussed. Um, there are several, several references, but the, the main reference that uh, I think is important to check to see is this one. And I want to say thank you um, to the, my unity, uh, my research unity and to my team. So thank you for the opportunity. And if you have some questions, I'm available to say something. <laughs>